Hey, does everybody like my mug? Everybody like my... Uh... <laughs> hey, you guys did a great job cheering the other day against, against the... That was awesome. And girls, I'm sorry. I have not been there to help you, or I haven't been able to cheer even when I've been there. But um, maybe, maybe once we get to tournament time, I'll have my voice back and I'll be able to really <clears throat> let her fly. Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. You guys got me? Good. Sounds good. All right. You got it. Religious robots. You say, what in the world is that? I don't know. What's a robot? What's a robot? It's a machine. It's programmed to do something. Does a robot have a heart? No. Now, I know some of you are going to say, well, actually, they came up with this new thing where this engineering and they can implant thoughts and blah, 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 blah. Okay, whatever. When we think of a robot, we think of something that goes through the motions, right? Goes through the motions. It does actions. It does things for you or does things on its own, whatever. And uh, a lot of times they're good because they make things more productive or whatever, but a robot really just does what it's told and has no uh, desire to go beyond that or has no desire or understanding of the heart behind it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Let me ask you a couple questions to begin with. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> well, let me make this statement first. God, <laughs> let me ask you this question, actually. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. How many of you have somebody in your class who's a know-it-all. Don't say that. He's not in your class, Zach. You can, you can beat him later, okay? I will, no, I'll hold him down for you. I will, I will let you. Anyway, you have somebody in your class who's a know-it-all? Now, don't say their name, okay? Don't say the person's name. That would be kind of rude. But you know how that person just came to your mind? By the way, don't you hate it when uh, the person who says, yeah, somebody else is a know-it-all, they're a know-it-all too? <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Anyway, you got know-it-all. Sometimes I can be a know-it-all, and I shouldn't be, and I, God forgive me for that, especially with my kids, you know. I'll always tell them, no, that's not right, no, that's not right. And last night, my son was, uh, was trying to help clean up around our tiny house that we're building, and, um, and my daughter, my oldest daughter, Jesslyn, was, was trying to help him. And everything she did, literally everything she did, he said, no, 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 Jessel, no, 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 no. And I said, Jay, stop. You need to stop telling your sister no. You need to just let her help, blah, blah, blah. So then Jay started doing something. I said, no, Jay. Ah, caught myself. You know where kids get it. You get it from your parents a lot of times and the people around you. So you got know-it-alls, okay? Some people just think they know it all. Do you realize that there is someone who really does know it all? And that's God. He knows not just your actions, and I know that you already know this, but I'm going to remind you. Not only does he know your actions, Garrett, he also knows the intents of your heart. He knows what's deep down inside, and he knows the motive behind what you do. See, the Bible teaches us that man looks on the outward appearance, right? I see what Trinity does, and I make a judgment call based on what she does. But God looks at Trinity and knows the truth behind why she's doing what she's doing. Now, obviously, that means that we as individuals need to make sure that what we do on the outside is right and appropriate uh, according to the word of God because we have commands in there and because we need to have the right reputation and testimony before others around us. But even more important than that is what's on the inside. Even more important than the outer exterior of yourself and what you do is the heart behind why you do what you do. And so God knows the motives of your heart. Let me ask you this. Uh, you went to church on Sunday, hopefully. Uh, you went to church this weekend at some point, And let me ask you a question. Why'd you go? Why'd you go? Did you go because your parents told you to? Did you go because, well, that's just what we do on Sunday or Saturday for some of you? This weekend church thing, Sunday, Saturday night. I've never understood that. But it happens. Why'd you go on Wednesday? Oh, we got teen service, man. It's awesome. But did you pay attention to the message? Or did you just laugh at all the funny things that Josiah and Adam and whoever else did when they were in front of you? Who does lead the singing anyway? Oh, I'm totally wrong. Anyway, you got, I mean, why'd you go? Why were you there? Why were you a part of that? 
Um, if God were to come to you right now and ask you, why did you read your Bible today or last night? Why did you do that? What would your answer be? Remember, he knows the answer, Dominic, right? He knows that answer. He knows deep down inside why you do what you do. And sometimes we do the right things, but we don't necessarily do them for the right reason. If God asked you, why did, why did you not involve yourself in a particular sin or something that maybe your parents asked you not to do, or, or the school said, hey, we don't want you doing this uh, while you're on our campus or whatever, uh, why would you say that you did that? What would you say if God asked you that? That's what we're talking about, our, our motives. More often than not, we do our Christian lives instead of being Christians. Did you catch that? More often than not, we do our Christian lives. And I'll tell you this right now. No person in this room, whether a student or a teacher or a youth pastor or anybody, graduates, it doesn't matter who you are. We are all susceptible to doing our Christian lives rather than being Christians. I've had those times in my life. You may have had those times in your life. And by the way, let me take a step back and say, if you've never been a Christian, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior truly, all the way down on the inside that you have put your faith and trust in Him, you can't even do the Christian life. You can walk through the motions. You can pretend. You can fake it because you know what you're supposed to do. But there's no way that you can truly deep down inside be a Christian until you've accepted Christ as Savior. So if that's your position right now before Christ, I challenge you to get that taken care of. That's not the subject at hand, but I felt like I should say that right there. You know, in, uh, in the Word of God, there was a group of people who, was, who exemplified this. I mean, they did religion, but they really didn't have a heart for it. You know who those people were? What's that? Some of you are with me. Some of you are smart. The Pharisees. You know, the, the word Pharisee is not a very positive term, is it? How many of you would like to be called a Pharisee right now? I didn't think so. Some of you are like, should I raise my hand there and be funny, or should I not? Should I, should I not? No, you don't want to be a Pharisee. Even, even the world doesn't like the word Pharisee. A Pharisee is someone who says one thing, but is really a hypocrite about it. And by the way, you know, we can call people hypocrites or Pharisees because we don't like how they did something or whatever, but truly a Pharisee is someone who does religion on the outside, but is not regenerated on the inside. That's really what a, a Pharisee is. They are truly a hypocrite. They act as though they are right with God, but they really are not. They act as though they are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, but they have no more salvation than the man in the moon. And we don't, obviously don't want to be Pharisees. And I want to liken this idea of doing Christianity rather than being Christians to the idea of a robot or living mechanically, okay? Doing something because I've been programmed to do it, not because I really have a heart for it in my life. And let me ask you this question right now. Do you have a heart for God? Do you have a desire to serve God with all of your heart and to not just be or not just do Christianity, but have a vibrant relationship with Christ where you are a Christian in every sense of the word? Rather than just, I have my fire insurance that I'm going to heaven one day, I won't have to go to hell, and I'm just going to do whatever I want for the rest of my life. Now, when the school tells me to do this, okay, I'm going to do it so I don't get in trouble. But when I'm not, when I'm not around school, boy, I'm going to do whatever I feel like. When, not, when my parents tell me to do this, you know, I'll make sure that I do it. But as soon as I'm out of the house, man, all bets are off. I'm going to have a great time. I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing. God help us that we be not religious robots, but that we would be genuine servants of Christ. So here's the premise of the message today. If you want to live a mechanical Christian life, here are seven things that you should do. Now, let me, let me say this again, okay? Because we're kind of going at it from a little backwards idea here. I'm not telling you necessarily how you can not be a religious robot. I'm telling you these are the ways to be a religious robot, Okay? So here we go. Number one, if you can give me that first one up there, guys, seven things that we can do. Number one, be overly concerned with what others think. 
Be overly concerned with what others think. Let's get to the word of God because that's really what's going to speak to your heart, hopefully. Verse number two of Matthew chapter number six, if you look there. The Bible says this, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. If you go back, excuse me, to verse number two, uh, you see the phrase, that they may have glory of men. Oftentimes in our Christian lives, we are very concerned about what others think about us, okay? Very concerned about what others think about us. We want to make sure that everybody around us thinks that we are um, cool, that we are something special, you know? Uh, girls, a lot of times we want to be good looking. Guys, we want to be studly and buff and all that stuff and have big big chest muscles where we can uh, flex and big arm muscles and all that stuff. And man, I, I look athletic and I'm cool and I can shoot and I can, I can kick the ball perfectly. I can place it in the upper left-hand corner, no problem from 35 yards out. And I can do all these things and, and I, can, uh, I can slam a volleyball in somebody's face and all these things. We are overly concerned with what everybody around us thinks. And it's not just in like sports types of things, but in our looks, in all the things that we do. And um, actually that translates into our Christian lives as well sometimes. Sometimes we'll look around us and we'll determine based on who's around us how Christian we need to be at that moment in time. Hmm, let's see. Oh, I'm around the leader of the youth group uh, who's very spiritually uh, spiritual, so I better be spiritual right now. I better not say that thing that I might say around some other friends. But then when you get out and about and you're just around some friends who may, you know, use some off-color language or something like that, or they're okay with a dirty joke here and there, they're okay with listening to some music that's not pleasing to God, they're okay with some of these things, oh, then all bets are off, I'm going to be fine with that. How Christian do I need to be right now because I'm more concerned about those around me than I am with pleasing Him who saved my soul? You know, we ought not to be concerned with those around us. We ought to be concerned only with what Christ does. Sometimes we'll involve ourselves in a particular type of sin or whatever because of who is watching. Notice what I just said there. We will involve ourselves with a certain type of sin because of who's watching. Because we think, oh, I can be cool. Everybody will think I'm really cool if I do this right now. Yeah, okay, that's great. But what about God? What about Jesus? He sees everything we do. He knows the motives of our hearts. Sometimes we hear it the other way. We think, well, because these people are around, I'm not going to do this. Sometimes we actually think the complete opposite. I'm going to do this because these people are around. Really, I know I shouldn't. In my heart of hearts, I know I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't say these words. I know I shouldn't act this way, have this bad attitude. But because this person's there and I want to be cool in their eyes, I'm going to be a jerk. Where's that in the Bible? You've heard peer pressure tons and tons of times, right? You, you've heard that term over and over again in your lives, and, and it is a real thing. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't just stop when you stop being a teenager. It goes way beyond that. As a matter of fact, my son at seven years old, he experiences peer pressure as well. And obviously, I'm trying to teach him and train him that it's more important to serve God than anybody else. But peer pressure is a real thing. Daniel, come here. Stand up here. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. You know what I think would be really cool? Is if you were to face plant right there. I bet you wouldn't get hurt. I bet you wouldn't even break your nose. You think you'd do it? No, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Imagine if you face planted right there. Everybody would think you're so cool. As a matter of fact, if you would do it, I would let everybody get their, their uh, devices out that they're not supposed to have right now and video it, and we can put it on YouTube, and you would go viral. Would that be awesome? Wouldn't it be cool? That would be so cool. Guys, don't you think that'd be cool? Come here. Come here, all three of you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, I, get him to do it because that'd be, get up here, get up here. No, 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 get up here and get him to do it. Come on, come on, Daniel. How many of you think he can face plant right there and it'll be the coolest thing in the world? Come on, don't you think he can do it? Yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be amazing? Get him to do it. Come on, get him all, get him all lathered up, okay? Get him ready. All right, Daniel, here we go. Daniel, 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 Daniel. Daniel. Aren't you going to do it? Come on, man, face plan. Don't you feel it? No, you feel like you really should. 
even though you know it'd be the dumbest thing in the world to do, you're like, oh, everybody's watching me. Maybe, maybe I should. Maybe I should. Maybe I should do the whole fall and catch myself thing. Can you do that? Can you do that? You think you can catch yourself before your face hits and you ruin that beautiful nose? Don't you think he can do it? Do you think he can do that whole push-up thing, fall and catch himself? How many of you think Danny can do it? Look at those muscles. Come on, man. You guys are not helping me. You're the peer pressure. Come on. No, really, Gabe. Try to get him to do it. Come on. Can he do it? Do you think he can do it? Don't you want to see him try? Don't you want to be the one up there in his place? <laughs> All right, have a seat, guys. That didn't work as well as I was hoping it would. I thought maybe you'd try. I thought I'd be really good at the peer pressure thing, and I thought maybe your friends would help you a little bit more. But let me ask you a question. What do you find your identity in? What do you find your identity in? Do you find it in what others think about you, or do you find it in Jesus Christ? Philippians chapter number 3, verses 9 and 10 says this, Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Then verse number 10 says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. We need to know Christ and find our identity in him, not our own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We ought not to be concerned about what others think about us ultimately. Ultimately, we need to be concerned about what Christ would think about us. But if you want to be a religious robot, if you want to go through your Christian life being mechanical, having no heart in it, then go ahead and be worried about what everybody around you thinks about you. Number two. Number two. Pray like a heathen. You say, what? Heathen? Do they pray? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they pray. But there are certain ways that they pray. Look at verse number five. It says this, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Right there. The Bible indicates that hypocrites pray. People that maybe aren't even regenerated, they still pray. There are people that go through prayers constantly and they don't know Jesus any, any more than the man who's never heard the name of Jesus, okay? Verse number five, continuing. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, but thou will now pray us. Watch this. Enter into thy closet and when thou hast Shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not. Now here's what they do, okay? This is, how the, this is how the heathen pray. Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Now God wants to hear us pray. He wants to hear us say, Lord, I need this. I need your help. I need... I, you know, there's, there's a need that I have, and I know that only you can meet it. He wants to hear us pray, but he already knows what our needs are. He already knows how we can meet those needs and, and whether he's going to meet them or not, but he wants to hear us pray. And then you see the Lord's prayer that is, that is given right there, which is a model for us to pray from. And just the types of thoughts there. But I want to focus here for just a minute, uh, not necessarily on the Lord's prayer, but on the fact that heathen pray, but they don't pray the way that they ought. And sometimes we as religious robots, our prayers are like unto the heathen. They pray in public, but not in private. If you're taking notes, write that down. How do the heathen pray? They pray in public, but not in private, unfortunately. Now, does that mean that a person who is, un, a person who is saved, but they don't pray in private, that all of a sudden they become heathen? No. But we're like them. And unfortunately, we can get into that sometimes. We get busy. Other things become more important to us. And we don't pray as we ought to. And we, you know, when the, the teacher says, hey, would you pray to open the class? And you're like, um, uh, uh, okay. And you know you don't have a choice. But you know you haven't prayed for anything in like a year. You're not ready to pray. They use vain repetitions. That's the second thing. What's a vain repetition? Somebody tell me. What's that? Mm -hmm. They say the same thing over and over again, but without what? Without any meaning, right? 
And it's not just a, a particular group or a religious group of people. You know, Baptists can do the exact same thing. For those of you that go to Baptist churches. You know that anybody can be vain in their repetition in prayer? My son, every time he prays for a meal, says the exact same thing over and over again. He says, do you thank you for this food? Help, or uh, who is it? What's, there's three, three people that he prays for. And one of them is completely healed, but we can't get it through his brain that they're, they're, you know, we don't really need to pray for him anymore because that prayer request is, is, has been answered. But he always prays uh, uh, somebody, Mary Lou, and Greg Bryant. In Jesus' name, amen. Exact same prayer every single time. And after he prays, he's like, thanks, Jay. You know, um, we could vary that just a little bit. Why? I'm trying to teach my son not to be vain in his repetition, saying the same thing over and over and over. Dear Lord, help us have a good day. Help everybody to do well in their tests and quizzes today. Help us not to get any demerits in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have heard that prayer before class this year? Yes, exactly. Do you know why? Because we're praying like the heathen do. We're not thinking about what we're saying. The teacher told me to pray, so I'm going to say these words, but I don't mean it any more than anything else that I tell people. We don't mean anything that we say sometimes. Lord, help us. Why don't you start your prayer and say, God, forgive me for my sin so that this prayer can be heard. Lord, forgive me for how I was rude to the person across the room. Imagine that prayer going on before class starts. You guys know just as well as I do. You know that person doesn't mean it any more than you do. You know what I mean? Now, I will say this. I'm not judging whether or not you mean what you pray. Maybe you really are thinking, hey, Lord, help us on this test, because I know I didn't study, and I definitely know since I'm a good student, nobody else studied either. So, Lord, please help them. But you know what? We've got to stop praying in vain repetition and just throwing words out there but really talk to God. I wrote down this statement. I want you to really think about it. If we are to pray like a Christian and not like the heathen, listen now, we must make prayer a time when we are talking directly to our God personally, listen, no matter who else is listening. Where I am talking to God personally, when I stand here at the end of this message and I pray and ask God to work in your hearts and to help you solidify any decisions that you may have made. I want to be praying to God personally, no matter if you're listening or not. And that's how we ought to be. Number two, pray like the heathen if you want to be a religious robot. Number three, and we got to move move on. I've taken too long on the first two. Number three, keep a bitter spirit against someone who hurt you. Keep a bitter spirit. If you want to be a religious robot, then by all means, keep your spirit bitter. Be upset at that person hate them, go after them, try to be spiteful and vengeful to them, go after them and try to make sure that their life is miserable because you're bitter against them. Verse number 14 says this, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. You say God won't forgive me? Yeah, if you won't forgive other people around you. I want you to get in your mind right now a person or people who have offended you. I want you to. I want you to put that face right in front of your brain. The person that made fun of you yesterday or this morning or three seconds before you walked in in here, that really popular person that everybody thinks is cool but they're a jerk to you, put their face right in front of your mind, okay? You got them? How about when your parents were rude to you, you know that they were having a bad attitude, they were having a bad day, and they got on your case for something you didn't deserve. Go ahead, put mom or dad's face right in front of you. you, You got it? You got somebody who you could say, I could easily be bitter against them. Okay, for those of you who are extra spiritual and you know you're not supposed to be bitter, you're saying, Mr. Pearson, don't make me do that. I don't want to sin. You're not sinning, okay? You're just doing what I'm asking you to do. Get that thought in your mind, okay? Now, that person has been terrible to you. Something they did to you made you mad, and you are upset at them, and you are not going to forgive them. Are you ready? What if God did that to you? What if God put your face in front of his mind and said, I am not going to forgive Emily. Her sin was too great against me. I will not forgive her. 
Imagine if God did that to you. You know what the Bible teaches us there? It's not that God doesn't want to forgive us. It's that our unforgiveness towards somebody else withholds his forgiveness of us. Are you catching that? Are you with me on that? You want to know why you don't get the help of the Holy Spirit in your life when the devil comes and tempts you? Do you want to know why? Want to know why it's just, I'm going to go through the motions and I don't have any heart in any of this Christianity thing? It's because we're not forgiving those around us. It's because we are withholding forgiveness and therefore God cannot forgive us. It says in his word that he won't do it because we won't forgive somebody else. It's all predicated on whether or not we're going to forgive somebody else. So that person that you had in your brain just a second ago, you know what I want you to do with that face? I want you to look at that face in your mind and I want you to say, I forgive you. You don't have to say it out loud. But I want you to forgive them. Do it right now. Don't wait until later on. Because if you want God's forgiveness in your life, then you need to forgive him. By the way, and this is very, very important, forgiveness is not, well, that person, it's not really bad enough for me to be upset. No, 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 no. When somebody wrongs you, it hurts. Would any of you agree with me on that? Does it hurt when somebody's a jerk to you? Anybody? Would you guys agree with that? Yes, it does hurt, doesn't it? I'm not downplaying whether or not it hurts. But what I'm telling you is this, our sin hurt God more than we can ever imagine because he loves us and he wants us to obey him and serve him. But you know what he does? He chooses to forget. He casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. Not that he can't remember them no more, but the Bible says he will remember them no more. It's a choice. It is your choice to forgive and pass off, never to bring it up again. I will never bring it up again. Yes, it hurt, but God forgave me of so much that I owe it to others to forgive them, and they in turn will forgive me for my actions, and God will forgive me. So if you want to be a religious robot, number three, keep a bitter spirit against someone who's hurt you. Number four. If you want to be a religious ro robot, complain about how hard it is to serve God. Just complain about it. Just say, man, I can't believe I have to do all this. I have to go to church. I have to read my Bible. And I have to sing. And I have to pass out tracts. Tell people about Jesus. Man, why do I have to do all that? It takes so much time. Why can't I just sit on Twitter or Instagram? Facebook. Why can't I just play with Candy Crush? What's the newest game? Why can't I just sit on my Xbox and play? Why do I have to do all this stuff to serve God? Man, it takes so much time, so much effort. Man, I sweat when I do things like praying. <laughs> I don't know. But you know what? You'll go out and you'll sweat and stay up all hours of the night doing something you want to do. Right? I just want to text my boyfriend. And you'll spend five hours a day doing that. Right? Come on. Now you guys are closing up. You're like, well, I'm not going to say this to that. But we won't spend time serving God. And then when we do, we just complain about it. Look at verse number 16. Moreover, when ye fast. By the way, fasting is a spiritual, religious exercise that proves to God you're serious about something. So in essence, right here, this is something that you can do to serve God. When you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. Oh, I'm so tortured with this fasting. I'm trying to prove to God that I am so uh, torn up about this important thing, and I'm going to uh, look very sad and disfigure my face and act as though, oh, it is so hard to fast before God and to show him how spiritual I am. That's basically what they did, right? For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. In other words, act as though it is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you in the world. And you know what? 
If you act like it, it'll become that way. What's my favorite phrase? You guys ready? Mind over matter. Mind over matter. That's a spiritual thought, really. If I decide that I'm going to do this because it's right before God and because he's commanded me to do it, listen, then I'll be happy about it. But if I whine about all the negative consequences of it and how it takes all my time or whatever, boy, that's getting loud right there. Sorry about that. It takes all my time and, I, oh, I'm so torn up about this. Then guess what? I'm going to be miserable. Decide that you're going to be happy about serving Jesus because you've been commanded to. And remember, you serve him not because it's good for you, but because he's commanded you to do it. You want to please him with your life. And you don't want to be a religious robot, right? Got to move on. That's number four. If you want to be a religious robot, complain about how hard it is to serve God. Number five, let it be known you never had enough. Okay, right now, if you did not have breakfast this morning, you did not have breakfast this morning, would you stand for a minute, please? Just stand. Okay, now, if you are standing, by the way, by your count, everybody else, you ate something this morning, okay? Now, all of you who are standing, boy, Brother Kurt, I'm, I'm, I'm running a risk right here. How many of you, you, you need to remain standing? And there's a reason for this, okay? Because uh, if you remain standing, we are going to run and get you something to eat, okay? Are you ready? How many of you, if you are, st if you are standing, not only did you not have something to eat, but there was nothing in your house that you had the choice to eat, okay? So if you could have eaten something, but you just decided not to, sit down. You guys didn't get it. Bradley, was there a granola bar somewhere in your house? Nothing? Was there a milk? Nothing? How come your sister's not standing? <laughs> oh, I'm going to get you a granola bar, okay, buddy? Because you need something to eat, all right? You guys with me? Nobody's standing. Do you know why? Tell me why. You had plenty, didn't you? If you wanted it, you could have eaten, right? You know, we live in a very materialistic society. How many of you have a cell phone? Raise your hand. Don't hold your phone up. What are you doing? No, I'm just kidding. Look at that. Some of you are 12 years old and you have a cell phone. What in the world? What do you need a cell phone for? Well, I go on such long trips and my mom needs to get a hold of me. What do you mean? You're always with a teacher. Then call your teacher. Is so-and-so on the bus? Yes. Where on the bus? On the top. Yeah. Why do you need a cell phone? To play my games. Yeah, exactly. So I can text my friends. Exactly. You don't need to do that. Call them on the phone. Mom, can I use your cell phone? Sure. Here, call your friend. Okay. Uh, can I talk for three hours to my boyfriend? No, you don't have a boyfriend. Your boyfriend is your dad, okay? That's what I teach my kids. My little girls, I am their boyfriend. You got me? Hey, guess what? You know what Jay's girlfriend is? My wife and his sisters. Ew, that's gross. No. Teaching him to love his family. Bless God. Girlfriends and boyfriends only happen when you're going to get married, all right? Praise God. That was free, Brother Kurt. Throwing it in there. <laughs> I'll stop there. We live in a very materialistic society, guys. We have everything that we want, don't we? Look at me. You have everything that you want, mo excuse me, <coughs> mostly, and you certainly have everything that you need. There's nobody in here that's living below the poverty line. Nobody. And I can say that factually, not even knowing where, where you are in your life. The fact that you are in this school means that you have enough to meet your needs. Because you have clothes on. <laughs> I just had that thought. I was like, ooh. <laughs> Passed that one really fast. We live in a very entertainment-driven society. We think that we don't have enough because we don't have our wants. We have everything that we need. And boy, we'll complain about it. Remember what, the, you know, remember what God did to the people that complained about things in the Old Testament? <laughs> Dead. You will die. 
God didn't say it like that, but that's my rendition of it. You ever heard of the song, God Owns a Cattle on a Thousand Hills? The wealth in every mind. You know that song? You know what that means? God will provide everything that you need. The problem is that we want more than we really need. And we will complain day and night about what we don't have, but we're focused on the things that are our wants. The Bible teaches us that we are to be content with such things as we have because he'll never leave us nor forsake us. <laughs> Here's what 1 Timothy says. And having food and raiment. What is that? Clothing. Let us therewith be content. So that means that if you had breakfast and you have clothes on your back, you have enough and you are to be content, according to the word of God. According to our society, you need a cell phone, you need a television in every room, you need a 3,500-square-foot uh, 3, house or more to be happy and successful. You need to have the latest car, the latest truck, some sort of um, um, extra recreational vehicle of some kind, not an RV, but maybe a dirt bike or something like that. you got to have all those things. you got to be able to go on vacation at least twice a year and go wherever you want, whether it's a cruise or to... Disney World or to the Bahamas or to Bermuda or uh, Europe, for crying out loud. You've got to be able to do all that stuff, and then you can be content. And if not, you better complain all you want to, because that's not fair. Sorry, the Bible says, food and raiment, be content. Every one of us needs to be content. And if we're not content, do you know what we're doing? And this is huge. Would you please understand this? This is huge. If we are not content with the things that we have, then we are looking at God basically and saying, you're not fair. You're not fair. Why? Because everybody else around me has more than I do. Who cares? Rejoice with them that rejoice. Rejoice about the fact that somebody around you has extra and is blessed. But don't look at yourself and say, I don't have enough. Oh, yes, you do. We want to be religious robots. We're going to focus on ourselves and on what we want instead of the fact that God has blessed us and provided for us. Number six, two more quick things. Here we go. Number six, worry about the future. Verse number 34 says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Worrying about the future. Let me just make this really simple. Worry is sin. We don't think of it that way. We think of, you know, taking drugs and killing people as being sin. Yes, those are, I mean, those are huge sins, yes. But sin is sin is sin. And for us to worry about our future or worry about, um, you know, how God is going to provide for us or whatever, all of that is still sin, and here's why. Let me kind of explain it to you. When we worry, we are basically saying, God, you are not strong enough or good enough to take care of my problems. Basically, it's a direct attack on the character of God. Is God, um, I was going to say the big word, but I'm going to say this, all-powerful? Yes or no? Is God omniscient? What does that mean? Which means, does he know how to take care of you? Sure he does. That relationship that you're struggling with right now, whether it's a friend or maybe at home somewhere, parent, sibling, whatever, does God know how to help you through that? Yes or no? Does he really? Now, I have a feeling that that wasn't me just kind of saying something glibly. I have a feeling that everyone in this room whether you are struggling with a relationship with someone right now, and please don't take that to mean boyfriends and girlfriends. We've already established that. I'm talking about a real relationship, like somebody whose blood, like your mom or your dad or your siblings or maybe a grandmother or grandfather, and something is just between you, and it's, and it's eating at you. It's, it's hurting you or it's hurting them. Can God help you to take care of that? Yes, absolutely. 
Should you worry about it? No. Do you know what you should do about it? Tell me. Pray about it. Hand it over to God. You do your best to be right in that situation. Give it to God. And God will take care of it. Don't worry. Don't attack God's goodness. Don't attack the grace and mercy of God and how he can control everything that needs to be controlled for our good. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. Right? To them who are the called according to his purpose. Are you walking the way that you should with God or are you being a religious robot? Stop worrying about the future. Number seven, stay in critical gear. Stay in critical gear. Uh, chapter number seven, the first five verses say, judge not that you be not judged for with what judgment you judge, you should be judged. That doesn't mean that you can't judge. The rest of the verses teach us that. Watch this. And what, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Look, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine own eye and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Verse five, here's what it really means. Not, you can't judge me. No, here's what it means. Verse five, thou hypocrite, cast out the beam out of thine own eye. That was a big one, wasn't it? You still see it? I just spit all over Cameron. All over him. Don't miss this point. Come back to me, okay? Here we go. First cast out the beat out of thine own, beam out of thine own eye. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. It doesn't mean you should never go to a brother and say, hey, I see this in your life. I think you, uh, let's pray about this. Let, let, me, let me see if I can help you through this. By all means, do that. But don't go to them when you already have trash in your own life, Right? That's what that means, not don't you dare judge me. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with making sure that we are right and clean before we help someone else. But you know what we do? We waste our life attacking other people instead of evaluating our own hearts. Did you catch that? We're all about looking at what everybody else is doing, whether we think that gives us license to sin or if we think that gives us the opportunity to just fire away at somebody and say, I'm better than them. That's pride. Right? Don't stay in critical gear. How about this? Praise the things that are good and right. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, my brethren, Think on, well, okay, I'll have to paraphrase it because I don't have it right in front of me. Think on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report. Does it say things that are negative or bad? No. The Bible says, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Focus on the positive, guys. Our whole society is all about what's negative. And we're going to criticize and tear down and make others look stupid so we can be better? No. The Bible never says that. It says take care of your own heart first and then try to help somebody else. Are you taking care of your own heart first? That's the question. Now we talked about seven, well, not quick things. I went a little longer than I should have. We talked about seven things today. Maybe one stuck out in your brain. Let me ask you this question. What's your motive in your heart? Are you serving God and doing what you ought to do because you are, in truth, genuinely trying to be a Christian, be like Christ? Are you doing those things because you know that's what you're supposed to do, but you really don't have a heart for it? You know what you ought to do today? If there's a specific area that we've mentioned that you know is something you need to take care of, then specifically talk to God about it today and ask for his help. And then take whatever steps you need to to get help with that. Get somebody to help you be accountable for it. Maybe you're critical all the time. And you're always attacking other things. Ask your closest friends. Hey, God spoke to my heart today. I'm critical all the time. If I say something negative about somebody, will you just point it out to me lovingly and kindly? There's nothing wrong with that. Wouldn't it be great if our entire student body were consistently trying to help each other to be built up spiritually instead of finding ways to be carnal and negative and be jerks to each other? Wouldn't that be great? What a sweet place this would be. It's already a fun place, right? How much better would it be? What is it you need to take care of with God today? 
genuinely from your heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of these young people. Lord, I love each one of them in this room. And some of them I know a whole lot better than others. You know that. And Lord, some of them I know have been taught and trained. And maybe Christianity has become a bit stale to them. Maybe they've gotten into the rut of doing Christianity rather than truly being a Christian. And Lord, there may be one or more in this place that don't know you as Savior. Maybe they don't. Maybe they've never made that decision, and maybe it's never been an important thing to them. Lord, I pray that through the testimony of others around them and through the power of the Word of God that you'd break through that and they would realize their need for you as Savior. But Lord, for the vast majority in this room, I believe that they're saved, and maybe they kind of want to serve you and kind of want to be a real Christian, but they're just stuck in some of these things that we've talked about. Lord, help them to take care of those areas. I'm going to make decisions that will last and will affect their entire lives. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to stand here and uh, Lord, speak from your word. I pray that your word would not return void and that you'd do something special in the hearts and lives of these teens. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a minute if you would. I want, I want you to just take a moment right now. And we're not going to have music. We're not going to sing. We're not going to do anything like a regular church service. But I want you to take a moment where I'm just going to be very quiet and just talk to God about that area. Whether it's the general thing of being genuine in your heart. But why don't you find something specific that you can work on and talk to God about that and make a decision to do right in that area.